Welcome to As the Story Grows. I'm Brian Patton. Today we welcome Scott Morrow to the podcast. Scott was the editor at Alarm Magazine, and Scott is now making waves with his new musical endeavor, Plutocracy Planet. The project's debut self-titled album is out this Friday, July 12th. Plutocracy Planet is an absolute wild ride of a record. There's no real guidepost where I can say if you like X, then you'll like this. The album features Bob Nana, Jonah Matranga, Matt Pryor, Liam Wilson, Mike Kinsella, and a ton of other incredible guest spots. It's a sonic journey and you never know what to expect from track to track, but it works wholly as an album. It never feels like a weird collection of singles thrown together to sell vinyl. It is a piece of work made and crafted to be listened to as a whole, and it's a rewarding experience. I highly recommend listening to this record on Friday. Scott talks about getting into music and the Chicago scene, his transition into journalism, how lockdown and getting shot impacted this project, how he put together the collaborations, and more. Thanks so much for checking out this episode of As the Story Grows. I hope you love it. If you're new to the show, welcome and thanks for listening. You can find links in the show notes or at asthestorygrows.com to our Discord server, our mailing list, and our Patreon page. All Patreon members get early access to every episode at a dollar a month. If you think someone might enjoy this podcast, go ahead and share it with them. Word of mouth is still the best way to share anything. Enjoy getting to know Scott Morrow from Plutocracy Planet. Log in and let your head spin, scroll trolls and hold your tongue. Don't be dumb, it's already begun. And in the sad land, some men are less than and not men are nothing. Can't be in a mass trial with me on your neck, so much for serving protein. Hate in their brains and a rage in their veins. Not sure that I've got my headphones properly working, but that's okay. I can hear you, right? So okay, that's that's good. <laughs> Let me know if there's any audio issues. Yeah, I can't. I'm always worried. Like occasionally, someone will not have headphones, and I can hear myself coming through. And I'm like, can we not have that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I can't right now, so we're good. <laughs> okay, cool, awesome. How how are you this morning? Oh, I'm all right. I just said my, I was having my first cup of coffee. And of course I managed to spill it all over like two minutes before I was logging on. Oh, here, so. <laughs> that's fun. That's, I, I had to take my wife to the train station this morning and I came back and the coffee was cold and I was like, I'll just save it, microwave it before uh, my interview. That'll be great. Just have some coffee at 11 a.m. <laughs> yeah. I'm not a morning person, so I'm ready for number two already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Where are you uh, located? I'm in Chicago. Okay. Is that where you're originally from or a transplant? Yeah. Chicago slash suburbs, Chicago land kind of lived all over at different nice. points. Nice. What was, uh, what was growing up like? Um, I don't know. Unevent- I mean, I lived so, um, I lived in the, north- the Northwest side of the city until I was seven family moved out to the burbs. So had, you know, kind of the quiet suburban upbringing there. And then, um, you know, got back into going to a lot of shows and stuff in my late teens, early twenties in the city. A lot of shows at um, Fireside Bowl. Um, so yeah, plus like a lot of suburban um, uh, basement hardcore shows. That was kind of what uh, <laughs> got me into stuff. Yeah, locally anyway. Um, so yeah, that was a big part of uh, of just yeah being being part of something and um, finding you know finding people that are. We're really into the same stuff. So yeah. Yeah. Chicago had, had a really vibrant music scene. It seems like it's back on the upswing. I've talked to a bunch of bands over the last few years. It seems like, you know, a, a good like post COVID uh, <laughs> scene coming back to Chicago. Yeah, I guess so. I hope so. I've, I mean, I've, I'm pretty um, removed, I guess, from a lot of the local stuff going on. You know, I know like some bands and I've got obviously friends who play, but in terms of just being like really up on what's happening, I'm pretty out of the loop. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, I mean, we got, we definitely got a lot of, uh, not just, you know, like hardcore heavy bands, um, was Chicago in general, obviously major yeah. scene metropolitan, uh, <laughs> cultural hub. So, um, yeah, well, I actually, I wrote, uh, I covered jazz. Um, I 
you know, my, I don't know how much you saw about my background as a music editor and writer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I previewed uh, jazz shows for a while here too. So definitely a lot of uh, vibrant um, musicians. Nice, nice. Yeah, I've, I've said recently, like, there's you you have age out of like the local scene, like being in the weeds because like you're in your 40s, you're not going to the basement shows anymore. Those yeah. aren't designed for guys like us. <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> my back. <laughs> yeah, I can't do it anymore. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. What was it that uh, initially got you into music and maybe into like underground, hardcore, whatever? Um, yeah, like the local underground stuff was really just um, friends in the, you know, that I went to high school with um, and people they knew that were in just the neighboring um, suburban towns putting on basement shows and just kind of getting sucked into that. Um, being drawn to that. I mean, my, you know, I've, I wasn't one of the first to do it by any means, but my <laughs> parents were cool with um, with me throwing some shows in our basement too. So nice. <laughs> it's like, um, yeah. And then my my friends in the band Spittlefield um, were a big part of. I mean, there's so so many bands that came out of um, sort of Western uh, DuPage area, but um, but yeah, I played in Spittlefield for a little bit uh, early on. And um, had a, a artsy post hardcore band called The Further Along, with a couple <laughs> friends. Um, but yeah, so um, that kind of like I just sort of uh, would play for myself here and there after those bands kind of died, and yeah. um, worked on sort of like early mid 2000s got into programming stuff on fruity loops okay which really kind of helped me realize that i could write in my opinion much better um <laughs> in a program yeah than uh you know having to perfect playing something and memorizing something on a guitar um so yeah that was sort of the the springboard for me to like figure out how to piece things together on a computer Nice, nice. At what point does like writing and covering music from a journalistic perspective come in? Like, is that something you went to college for? No, not at all. Actually, <laughs> um, it's kind of interesting. I took a very circuitous route to uh, to end up where I did. Um, yeah, just I uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do at all in college. And so I didn't go to school for any of that. When I graduated, um, a friend of mine, Dave Hoffer, uh, used to work for punk planet magazine. And, uh, I was like, Oh, it'd be fun to like write some music reviews and stuff. I just wanted, I knew I wanted to try to do something related to music. Um, and so I just like started writing about, I started writing reviews Mm -hmm. for them for that reason. And, uh, Sort of got some experience writing for them and um, and then Alarm Magazine where I ended up um, becoming editor for a while. But uh, yeah, it was just like, I just wanted to, because I wasn't really being very active with my own stuff at that point. Yeah. And I was just like, I don't know if I really want to ever try <laughs> to do, <laughs> you know, do the band thing again. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so I just kind of like got more experience. I got better at writing and editing and copy editing and um and yeah it was that was my way to like help in whatever tiny way i could um nice. support musicians that i thought were doing incredible things that weren't getting the the love that they uh deserve i'm sure you can relate to to <laughs> yeah no it's it's such part. like yeah it's such a like similar trajectory where yeah i played in bands and i went to school for recording which kind of helps doing podcast stuff and like you know, worked in radio, but I was like, all right, well, I don't have a band, but I want to write about music. And so it's like, I had a blog. And then a friend was like, Hey, I know this, you know, local paper, they need a music writer, email him. And then you write interviews locally on a, and it just keeps growing. And yeah, yeah, now I just talk to people. (laughs) Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Which is way better than trying to figure out, you know, new words to say, that was awesome, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, just, uh, and I'm sure that there are, you know, much better, like, and more accurate transcription services now. I, yeah. I get blown away seeing some of the, like, Instagram reels and stuff where it's, like, 
automatically yeah. transcribes and it's yeah. really pretty close most of the time but yeah transcription alone is a you know huge pain in the ass. yeah <laughs> yeah how'd you uh end up working with alarm um i just they were one of the magazines that um just kind of early on when i was uh you know, when I was doing some writing for Punk Planet, I was trying to figure out who else I could submit to and, or you know, write for, and um, started writing for them, and just kind of like, um, just basically like, it's like, well, I want to work for you, <laughs> like full time, <laughs> and uh, you know, basically just did like a, a glorified full time internship thing for a while, um, and yeah, it just kind of you know through grinding it out kind of yeah. got there eventually. Um, and yeah, it was, you know, it was, um, an experience I wouldn't trade for anything, but it was a lot of long hours and, um, you know, <laughs> it's, right. it's, uh, yeah. I mean, going to as many shows as you want for free is pretty awesome, right. <laughs> right. but yeah, it's, it's kind of like, you know, after that, um, after they, they kind of, uh, you know, well, I got let go because, <laughs> you know, there's no money in uh, music publishing, uh, right, least, right. You know, magazine, print magazines, but, uh, yeah, uh, I'm definitely, I've been doing like a, you know, I'm a full-time proofreader right now. So, um, <laughs> definitely like the, the nine to five thing. Talk to me about your experience. You you were hit with the stray bullet down in Puerto Rico. Was that kind of a catalyst for you starting this musical project? Uh, no, and okay, so it was actually here in Chicago, but it was the um, weekend of. Um, there's a we have a, a, a large Puerto Rican population here in Chicago, okay, okay. and um, the neighborhood Humboldt Park. It has a large population okay. and they celebrate every year and it usually gets pretty uh, wild. Um, <laughs> and there's always an increased number of shootings that weekend. Mm. Um, yeah. And, and so I was living in uh, Logan square neighborhood, which is like a neighboring neighborhood. And um, yeah, I was, I was walking through there, uh, you know, probably later at night than I should have. And um, I didn't feel uh, unsafe. Um, there were a lot of people out celebrating, um, in the streets, on the sidewalk, there were people everywhere. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I was going to a, a friend's place a little after midnight and, uh, I just felt a, a sharp pain in my back. And, uh, and I was like, what was that? And uh, I didn't, uh, I couldn't, I didn't feel, I felt myself and I didn't feel any holes or blood yeah. or anything. <laughs> and, um, and then I very quickly uh, started feeling woozy and I had to lay down in the grass. Oh. I passed out and uh, I woke up. I don't know how much later. It couldn't have been that long. Probably within 10 minutes um, to uh, cops around me. Um, and they took a look at me and they're like, you've got a, a hole in your back here. So I said, well, that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's and then... Um, yeah, it was, it's a uh, it's such a long story because um, there was the emergency surgery right away, and yeah. um, I lost uh, I lost a couple organs. It was there was a lot of damage that alone was obviously very life threatening, and then um, quickly developed um, an abscess, <clears throat> an infection of uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria. It turned out to be a few different types but that was not properly diagnosed by the place that operated on me oh. so it was um it was about an eight month recovery and uh i was in the hospital was hospitalized 12 times over that time and um like had a had a drainage tube the whole time it was uh yeah it was a lot of like it's a horrible horrible experience of course yeah. <laughs> imagine um i wouldn't wish on anybody but um, no, I, I had started the project about 
uh, a little over a year before that. Okay. So the um, COVID was really the catalyst, the gotcha. shutdown, <laughs> and uh, and I had a lot of extra time, of course, as we all did. Yeah. yeah. And so I was like, well, I've never really messed around in GarageBand before, and I've got a free copy on my computer. So let me see what I can do in there. And um, there was enough um, functionality in it that was similar enough to what I've used in the past. I was like, well, yeah. I can... I can do some stuff with this and uh, pretty good like bank of, of sounds and, and MIDI okay. stuff and um, without even having to like pay for expansion packs and stuff. So, um, so yeah, like, but at the time I got shot, it was most of the original like songs, demos, song structures were, were pretty much done and everything was kind of in various uh stages of completion um there were the first actually what what ended up being the first two singles that are out now um with bob and jonah were uh the first two like really be basically done being mixed and um i was actually listening to both of them when i was walking when i got hit by the bullet oh man (laughs) it's like it's still pretty early on in like in in listening to having like mixes and you know know how it goes you listen to them over and over and you're like i want to change this you know (laughs) um so but yeah so like at that point uh maybe half the songs had um vocals already submitted so yeah, that obviously was uh, was a setback. Yeah, um, in terms of getting this thing done, and uh, and yeah, and just also like, um, you know, it was I was able to get I think more. You know, obviously at that time during COVID, no one was touring, so um, you know that was a benefit to try to get people to work. Yeah otherwise doing anything to be like, Hey, you want to take part in this completely unknown <laughs> yeah, sociopolitical project? <laughs> uh, um, and then, you know, when people went back to touring, it was like obviously harder. Yeah. But, uh, but it was interesting too, with COVID, like there, you know, no one was really doing anything or people were just, obviously we're all sorting through this, you know, <laughs> uh, scary experience but yeah. i'm just completely you know in our lifetime we've never experienced anything like that so just um uh, but it like so i maybe naively thought like well it'll be even though like no one's really doing anything maybe it'll be easier to you know like everyone was kind of in their own um Bubble. yeah well just like their own uh they dealt with everything in their own way yeah, right? yeah. so um I think for a lot of artists, just, you know, this is just anecdotal, but talking to friends or whoever, just like some people were really motivated to be artistic and and productive during that time. And some people were like, the world's ending. I don't know how to process this. I'm not going to do anything right now, you know? And so I think that was, that was an interesting um, dynamic for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. It's collective cultural trauma and everybody processed it, processed it differently yeah yeah my my experience is the same just talking to people it's like some people were like all right this is my opportunity to finally sit down and make something and other people were just like fuck what <laughs> right <laughs> yeah, yeah. you have lost motivation and you're just like shell-shocked and <laughs> how do you be creative in those moments especially if you're older and a parent and oh uh, right yeah. At home <laughs> yeah i couldn't even imagine like i don't have children to like yeah like everyone just stuck in the same, you know, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. three bedroom apartment or whatever with, you know, full family. Like, yeah. Our, our open townhouse that we lived in at the time in Philadelphia and you know, both kids and my wife's working from home. And she's like, I'm on a meeting. Be quiet. I'm like, I, their kids are like four and two. I'm like, I, I'm sorry. Yeah. Everybody has to adapt. Right. <laughs> like, right. Yeah. Yeah. If, if your boss can't handle that, their children screaming, I like, that's his fucking problem right yeah no <laughs> everything totally. sucks right now <laughs> we're <laughs> plutocracy planet where'd the name for this project come from you talk about this socio-political uh output like yeah vision. <laughs> yeah kind of uh interesting maybe not, i don't know i don't know how interesting it is but it uh a little funny to me it's uh, it was um 
you know, I'm not a real uh, t-shirt designer by any means, <laughs> but I've <laughs> had a uh, like long, long time ago. Um, Mark Rose from Spitalfield and I, he's, he's one of my very closest friends. We, we did a little short lived uh, t-shirt line called Lava Bat, like in the <laughs> mid two thousands. And it was all just like me messing around in Photoshop. And I still have such a rudimentary uh, <laughs> you know, s- skill set um, with that program, but um, but I've done my share of like messing around in it. And, um, so I kind of did that again in the, maybe around 2017. I was like, Oh, it'd be fun to just mess around with some designs and like came up with some stuff that I thought looked cool and, um, realized like, Oh, like you can, it's a lot easier to do on demand printing and you can, mm-hmm. you know, I set up my own artist shop at threadless or whatever. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so like the original, um, I made the original cover for uh, the Plutocracy Planet album. Um, yeah, it was the original design for one of the shirts. And so um, and when I made that, I was like, ah, oh. just I had absolutely no plans to do any sort of music project at the time. But I was like, that would be kind of like a cool band name, like album cover thing. <laughs> it's the theme for a project. Yeah. And and so, yeah. So then when I started like tinkering around again in garage band, I was like, you know what, maybe that would be a good, you know, and, and like, um, I, I don't, I don't know. Like, I think, you know, I love, um, bands and artists that, um, you know, are much more like their lyrics are much more personal. You know, I'm into like, you know, late nineties emo stuff and whatever right. I, yeah. I tell by some of the collaborators on the album. So I love stuff that's really like deeply emotionally resonant. Um, but like personally, I think like I would rather for myself, my own projects, like I'd rather try to say something that's a little like bigger than me, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and that's obviously no shade to anyone who's, you know, writing about what's personal to them. And and a lot of, you know, the stuff that's on the album too is, is stuff that's still personal to me. It's just about bigger topics. Right. So, um, yeah, that was kind of the impetus of it It just kind of came out of a, an old t-shirt design I was messing around with. Nice. Nice. When you were choosing people to work with on this project, where there's a, I mean, there's like a mix of like, you know, some artists around the country versus some, a lot of older Chicago acts. I mean, Mike Kinsella and Bob from braid, like, was it just like people you had met over the course of being a writer or was it people you knew from Chicago and kind of just a collective of, Hey, who's interested? Yeah. Um, kind of a little bit of all of that. Um, like I said, Mark and I have been friends for, you know, I don't know, t- over 25 years. Okay. Um, been close friends with Bob for a long time. I've known Mike Kinsella for a long time and we've been buddies. And um, and so part of it was like initially for me, like, well, I, you know, I know a number of people that are awesome and, you know, might be down to to be part of this in some small way. And then, um, and, you know, and then Mark and Bob being close friends, they have so many connections and they they have, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with their company downright. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they have a lot of connections through that. Um, and you know, for, for the listeners, uh, downright is a, is a platform <laughs> where you can commission <laughs> songwriters, uh, yeah. to, to, um, create custom songs for you. Yeah. The and, old host of the pod would, there's a, as the story grows, like, song that uh bob did via oh. down right for the old host of the pod <laughs> okay amazing yeah 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 so some of it was through that um some of it also was you know um uh, as you're alluding to like connections i made over the years through writing about music and and yeah even like yeah just like because of um working for alarm for example like there are even people i maybe necessarily never really interacted with online became Facebook friends with right. <laughs> like, you know, that era of like, Oh, you know, we have got these mutual people in common. Yeah. So like um, Jonathan Hishke, who plays bass on a, a few tracks on this album and he's in a billion bands. Um, was just like, it was one of those kind of like random Facebook connections. And we would just like, you know, debate politics and stuff. On Facebook. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> And then, yeah, just eventually reach out like, hey, man, you know, do you want to play bass on some stuff? And so, yeah, there's just kind of a little bit of um, of everything. Nice. Um, but it is like 
an incredible honor and pretty surreal to me the the you know <laughs> the the people that agreed to be part of this and um and yeah including like some of my some of my all-time favorite bands are Estratosphere, Secret Chiefs 3, Sleepy Time Gorilla Museum, Mr. Bungle, these like very like amazing, incredible groups that mix so many different styles yeah. of things together and just like completely like virtuosos. Um, so getting people that have been part of some of those projects is just like unbelievable yeah. <laughs> dream come true. So yeah. yeah. Did you write all the lyrics or did you like have themes and just kind of let people singing do their own thing? inside that framework yeah kind of a also kind of a mix um i generally like presented the the overall overarching theme of everything and just kind of like let people go wherever that you know their inspiration took them um i wrote a f- lyrics for a couple songs there were a couple of songs i wanted to at least like specifically have a song about um the uh there's a song that's going to be the single that comes out in June. That's uh, about factory farming. For example, I wanted to have a song about that. And um, um, yeah, one of those other songs I wrote the lyrics to also was about the, uh, about Amazon and Jeff Bezos and the, <laughs> and just the, also the like billionaire space race. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it, it's just kind of like, I thought it was, it was cool the way it ended up because it was kind of like everyone took the theme their own way, of course, or took it towards like some, you know, like it's a big, it's a big, uh, I don't know, umbrella of, of, um, it can go kind of any direction, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Were there people you like, they had a thing that they were more passionate about that you said, Hey, I want you to write about X thing. Like I know, like, uh, Matt Pryor's done a lot. Like I, he's talked on various podcasts and interviews about like his daughter, has a band his daughter has a band that's like big into lgbtq plus like issues like were you like matt you write about that or anything like that or just whoever yeah. did the song best as a vocalist oh yeah yeah um yeah no it wasn't yeah well, I, I didn't really necessarily like there were only a couple instances i would say where i like approached a specific artist for a specific topic gotcha um like actually uh Swamberger, one of the rappers on the album came as a, uh, a referral from B Dolan. I mean, I knew of Swamberger anyway, but mm-hmm. I was looking for someone to rap on the song uh, about factory farming. And, uh, and Dolan was like, yes, Swam's like real, he's really into like vegan shit. So I was like, okay, <laughs> cool. So <laughs> we connected that way. And um, he put, you know, is a, he's got a couple of verses on that song that are totally killer. And then added, you know, the one to the, the prior song. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, not too much specifically seeking out like, Oh, you're, you know, <laughs> yeah. Bob, right. About like, you know, news media or whatever. <laughs> you're passionate about this, right. About this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Albums out July 12th. What, I mean, what are your hopes for this project? You're just happy to finally have it out there. Are you like, what, what are your plans and, hopes looks like for this album yeah i mean it's yeah in in one way it's just a huge accomplishment to get it done and out there after four years (laughs) (laughs) um yeah so locally we're gonna have a release listening party here in chicago at g-man tavern on july 12th so that'll be fun um it's there'll probably be no live performance it's such a studio concoction you know um just like (laughs) dj dj (laughs) right yeah i mean playing the cd from your ipad or whatever (laughs) yeah and like that's you know i've been to shows where like that can be cool and fun it's just like i don't know that i could pull that off in any sort of interesting way um (laughs) if i were ever to do a show for it i would want it to be at least like a live band with backing tracks but then even still figuring out the vocals would be you know a whole ordeal but um but yeah you know just getting it out there is going to be amazing um you know i just hope like you know thank you for for this interview um it's like to me i also want to honor all the people who you know very graciously contributed to this and um you know i just think about myself as a fan being like oh shit this project came out two years ago with all these incredible people on i never heard about it so you know i'm just doing whatever i can to, (laughs) to, to you know 
to get other people to hear about it that would that would be interested in it. So yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you just look at the names, and I'm like, oh, Mike from American Football, I'm Bob from Braid. I mean, those are two of my favorite bands, and yeah, L- Liam from Dillinger. I'm just like, oh, fuck, well, fuck yeah. Well, of course, I'm going to check this out. <laughs> <laughs> which, which is yeah, how I approach music, but you know you kind of understand not everybody's built the same way as music fans. And oh yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's what I'm hoping too. Like, I think, I don't know if, you, if you've had a chance to, um, to listen to the whole thing yet. Unfortunately, no. Um, okay. Well, I'm curious to, uh, to, to see what you think about it. Cause it, like, to me, it's, I think it's got a little bit of something for everybody. Um, you know, I think the, the sort of like through line, if you will, is sort of a, a post hardcore electronic, <laughs> infused bass yeah. that kind of like branches out from there. So like I'm because I haven't talked to that many people who've heard the whole thing yet. I'm curious to see, like to me, it feels cohesive, but yeah. diverse. And so like, yeah, even with, you know, one or more different singers on every track. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the benefit now too is like, you know, if people discover this and, they really like Jonah. They could throw Jonah's track on their playlist and have that song that they dig. And like, you know, yeah. there'll be people who consume the whole thing and people who just like pick and choose. And, you know, that's available to them. Right. Totally. Yeah. For, for better, or for worse. Right. Like mm-hmm. you want people to listen to the whole thing, but <laughs> well, yeah, of course. And, and like, you know, also uh, I don't want to be too like over the top about like, Oh, like track, track listing is like a lost art right you know, but i definitely the you know it's it was for some for me something that i considered a lot to the the yeah. flow of the album and um you know just putting like there's an intro and outro you know it's 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 <laughs> even though i'm definitely releasing it in a way where it's uh, you know maybe more of a a modern plan of like waterfalling content just yeah. releasing a song a month until the whole thing's out um, it's not just a collection of singles. So, yeah. 